everybody, I'm Nicole Vulcan, editor of The Source Weekly, and why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Jason Krupp, and I'm running to represent Ben in the State House, House District 54. So I've served for the last 15 years as a deputy district attorney here in Ben. Before that, I was a public defender. You know, much of my career has been involved in the juvenile justice system, kids in foster care and kids going through our delinquency system. You know, far too often I'll show up to court and there'll be a 13 or 14 year old kid who's there. And I'll know that kid's mom or dad or, or uncle or older sibling. And, I, and it's not that I know that our family members from soccer or some other social activity. I know them from other court cases. So every day I'm dealing and I'm working with people who are in crisis. I see the effects of underinvestment in Oregonians. And I'm running because I know we can do better. And better to me means making sure we have a fully funded school system so all kids have the chance to reach their fullest potential. Better means making sure everybody has access to the health care they deserve, especially now during this global health pandemic. Better means tackling the affordable housing crisis from all angles. And better means making sure that we have an economy that works for everybody. Better also, just given the wildfires, you know, wildfires being another reminder, we, now we need to take real action on climate change. Better means making sure that this beautiful place exists for our kids and future generations. Thanks. So a lot of what you mentioned we'll cover again sure. um, in different capacities. We're going to jump all over the place since it's in such a big role. Um, so first of all, we, um, you know, you and I are sitting in a park today. We're wearing masks. We're taking extra precautions. We're in the middle of a pandemic. So um, what's your take on how the state is handling the coronavirus response? And what do you feel the legislature's role is in supporting that? Right. So I would say it's mixed, some positive and some negative. And I'll start with the negative. The, the breakdown in the unemployment um, infrastructure to get those benefits out the door was really disappointing, right? We had, you know, people lost their jobs unexpectedly and very quickly. And it was, it was really unfortunate. It was a problem that needed to be fixed to get those benefits out the door. So in the future, we have to think about, do we have infrastructure in place to deal with crisis like this again? I think we've done a pretty good job as a state as far as giving clear information to people about how to be safe and measures they can take to, to make sure that we're keeping our infection rate down. You know, I have an eight-year-old daughter. I want to see our schools open. Um, I want to make sure our kids are safe when they're in school. And right now we need to make sure we're taking all the precautions necessary to keep our kids and our community safe and keep that infection, infection rate down. So I think the biggest things that are moving forward are going to be for the state, making sure that we have good information to help people be safe, making sure that we're targeting our funding for the people that are most impacted by COVID. We, we know that um, everybody, is, everybody has been suffering through this time, but there are people and businesses that are bearing the uh, majority of the brunt of this um, pandemic and this recession. So we gotta make sure that we are targeting funding to those people most impacted. What's, um, so there's gonna be uh, ongoing economic impacts from what we're experiencing right now. What's the single most important thing that the state legislature can do to help the Oregon economy recover? Well, we, you know, in March and April, we had an avenue. Single most important thing is to keep our people healthy and to keep our small businesses afloat, right? We had um, economic forecasts in March and April that was really grim. And the most recent economic forecast was better than expected. Now it was better than expected because of federal assistance to help um, recently, to help all citizens and federal assistance to help um, uh, businesses that have been struggling, you know, payroll protection loans, uh, making sure there was resources getting out the doors to give people the protective equipment they needed to, to be open. The other thing we learned from that forecast, like I said, is, is certain people are really, really struggling right now. And what we're learning is if we can keep businesses afloat, and if we can keep the infection rate down, and we, we can keep people in a stable place, our economic recovery will be quicker and more robust. So right now we have to make sure we're targeting our funding to those who are most impacted to make sure we can keep those businesses, businesses afloat. It's gonna be so much easier to recover economically if those businesses don't need to close, but we can keep their head above water. So you already mentioned wildfire. We just experienced and are still experiencing a, a number of massive fires. What's your stance on how to manage wildfire risk at the state legislative level? And what specific actions would you be working on if you so, earned this position? Yeah, the wildfires were, you know, another reminder that we're in the middle of a, of a climate change crisis right now. That climate change is also a crisis that we're dealing with. And it's a reminder to all of us that now is the time to take real action. We can no longer afford, we can no longer afford to talk about that issue. You know, I grew up in Malala, which is one of those towns that was evacuated. You know, a small timber town on the western slope. 
I, I never remember that kind of issue when I was a kid, the notion of wildfires in, in the community where I went to high school affecting that entire community. Now, we need to take real action on, on climate change. On the state level, because of the Republican walkout, there's been two sessions in a row where we haven't been able to take a vote on it. We have to say we're going to put a limit on our emissions moving forward, but as importantly, we have to make sure we're investing in a new way of doing business. We have to make sure that we're investing in clean energy jobs. You know, right now, there is a kid, kid, younger than me, a young person at OSU Cascades studying energy systems engineering. And that's not a degree that existed when I went to Oregon State. And that young person could be a big part of our future. We need to invest in that young person, that young person's education, and invest in those types of jobs and industries here in Bend. We have a number of businesses already on the ground level of that kind of work. If we gave them a little bit of investment and a little bit of help, we, Bend could be an incubator for a new type of economy, a new type of way of doing jobs. You know, I, I think about climate change and it's like, are we going to protect this place for our future generations? And are we going to be part of a new economy, right? Ben used to be a mill town and we've evolved and we have another opportunity to evolve even further. My fear is if we, if we stop and don't take action on climate change, that we're going to be left behind, that we're going to be left behind with the economy of the future. And it, it, votes against climate change, like the person I'm running, like Representative Health took, to me, that's a vote against our future. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, climate change has to be near the top of any legislative session moving forward. So uh, my next question related to the Republican walkout, which you referenced already um, in response to the last few attempts to pass climate change right. legislation. What would you do to specifically reach across the aisle and try to gain some consensus there? Yeah, the walkout was particularly difficult in a number of reasons. And, you know, last February, the walkout stopped a vote on climate change legislation. It stopped the vote on money for homeless shelters, right? It would have been two and a half million dollars for our community to build permanent ho homeless shelters. We're in scramble mode again to try to shelter um, people during the cold winter months. It stopped the vote on um, a new judge here in our, in our county. We have one of the most overburdened court systems in the state. I'm not a fan of changing our constitution as far as our quorum rules go. Um, I think there's other things that we can do, like, you, you know, if you don't show up to work, you don't get your pay or things like that. I mean, what I would do, I, I hope I come from a unique background that would help in this initiation. I grew up in a small town of 3,000 people, right? I grew up, I graduated high school from Malala in 1988. And that was right at the time that the bottom was falling out of the timber industry here in Oregon. I saw a lot of people in my town lose their livelihood. I saw a lot of people in my town not feeling heard not feeling part of the discussions of Oregon moving forward, and felt left behind as Oregon moved away from timber industry. That's always stuck with me. And, and, and the lesson I took from that that I'm going to carry forward to Salem is everybody deserves to have a voice in our process. Everybody needs to be part of our decision-making process. And I'm hoping my background and experiences will help bridge some of these really big divides here in Oregon. Thanks. Um, what uh, proposals would you support or do you, do you have to, to tackle reducing emissions in the state, if not the sweeping legislation that's had, had its day a couple times yeah. to no end? So I, I think we're sort of past small steps. I think it's time for real, bold, transformative action. Um, I don't think we can sort of nibble around the edges of this problem any longer. We have to, we have to say, here's where you have to put a limit on our emissions are, and then we have to begin the process of getting under those emission limits. That's everything from our transportation systems, how we're building, uh, moving away from fossil fuels to a, a more clean energy. I, I don't think we can nibble around the, the edges any longer. I think we need to take bold action if we want to protect this beautiful place for future generations. and if we want to be part of what I believe is going to be the new economy, a green energy jobs, more sustainable economy, I, I, we have a chance, I believe we have a chance in Bend and Oregon to be a big part of that future. But if we don't take action to make those kinds of investments, we're going to get left behind. So um, let's see, you're going to move on to police brutality, another sure. kind of, not even kind of, a, a big issue um, in, uh, in our state, in our country this year. In light of the series of bills that passed during the special session in response to police brutality protests, do you feel the state has done enough to address police accountability or should it do more? No, I think there's more work to be done. There was bills that passed that I'm supportive of. One of them that I uh, really appreciated was requiring officers to report the misconduct of other officers. 
Now that's something we already had at Bend Police Department. So part of it's about creating policies, but it's also making sure police departments create that culture, right? It's one thing to have a rule. It's another thing to have a culture that abides by that rule. You know, one of the measures that wasn't taking a vote on was having the attorney general's office or some other um, independent body review police use of force situations. That's something that needs to be explored. How do we create an independent review of those types of situations? The other piece of that, I believe, is what are we asking our police officers to do? What should they be do? What should they be working on and not working mm -hmm. on, right? We, we can't ask police officers to uh, deal with the homeless issue here in our community. We have to stop the sort of criminalization of that and get people who don't have a stable place to live the help they need. And that shouldn't be something that falls on our police officers. We also ask police officers to deal with issues of mental health and addiction issues. Those are other, other social services that can um, help with people in those types of crises. That being said, if we do have a pretty interesting model here in Bend. We have a level, Bend police officers have a level of training in responding to mental health crisis. They have a specialized group of officers and they work with our mobile crisis assessment team whenever there's one of those calls. So they work in conjunction with our behavioral health department to, to help people in crisis. So I think those types of um, uh, policies and training are a way to help move our police department forward. So that dovetailed right into another question I was going to ask about mental illness. Oregon ranks worse in the nation, both for a high prevalence of mental illness and low access to care, and has one of the highest rates of addiction nationwide. What can, or what can an Oregon representative do to reverse those trends? So I see that in my work every day, right? People in crisis, people with mental health issues that aren't resolved, people with unresolved trauma, people with addiction issues. And far too often we ask the criminal justice system to address those issues. I've seen people in my work make incredible, incredible changes in their life when they get the support and services that they need, right? But I see far too many people not having access to those types of services. I think I read something like one out of 10 people, one out of 10 people who need addiction uh, treatment or services actually are able to access it in the state. Um, you know, we, it, it's a question of how do you want to pay for this, right? Do you want to pay for a crisis on the back end or do you want to try to help people in crisis and prevent crisis on the, on the front end? Something like $6 billion we, we spend because of addiction issues, right? Loss of productivity, emergency room visits, jail visits. We need to start investing on front end services to help prevent crisis and to help people move past crisis. So to me, it's about funding um, mental health services in our community. It's about funding uh, addiction services in our, in our community. You know, I, I, I hear certain people say, well, it, something like that costs too much. And what I want to say is like, come down to my work and I'll show you the true cost of this, right? So, so think about spending $40,000 a year to incarcerate somebody instead of spending money on mental health treatment and housing and substance abuse treatment and education, right? We can get so much more value if we make real investments in those types of services to help people get back on their feet and get healthy. So housing first is a pretty, you know, well used term right now in, uh, this, in the realm of trying to help those who are without homes altogether. Right. Um, so that just made me think of that. But um, there's also the question of affordable housing. So we've got we've got the housing shortage for the for the lowest income people, right. but also you know the medium income folks. What are your proposals in, at the legislative level to just really keep momentum right. with that? Yeah, we need a greater variety of housing options here in Bend. Right, we're seeing more and more people work in this community who can't afford to live in this community, and I don't think that's a sign of a healthy community. That's not the sort of town that I want to live in. So on a base level, shelter, right? For people who are in crisis right now and just need a warm place to be, we need to have funding for shelters. Like I said, February session, there was a bill. <laughs> There's somebody walking right <laughs> It's okay, these mics are great. <laughs> there was a bill uh, that didn't get voted on because of the walkout that would have given two and a half million for Ben to have permanent shelter. Mm -hmm. I think it's a problem that you have to tackle from all different angles, right? There is, you know, I'm on our parks board and you might say, well, what is parks? or it have to do with affordable housing. Well, we just waived our, our service development charges, our permitting charges for the Wish Camper project. And, and that is something that I was proud that the parks was able to do and it's something that we have to expand on moving forward. On a state level, there you can provide state funding to help with get some of these projects off the ground. You can also, there's programs that provide um, 
tax incentives to offer low-cost loans to, to um, lenders to help these projects get off the ground. You know, one of the things I was really, really disappointed in, in my opponent was during a recent special session, she voted against the bill, a bonding measure that would have been put $50 million more into, a, into affordable housing here in Oregon. To me, that's just so short-sighted. I mean, we talk about this. It's really hard to have well-being and health and be productive if you don't have a safe place to live. You know, we talk about uh, medical care in, in, our, in, our, in our state. And, and we don't get the benefit of medical care if you don't have a place to live, if you're food insecure, if you don't have other stability pieces in your life. We have to do a better job making sure everybody has a safe place to call home. So another thing that's been discussed in terms of um, tackling the, the issue of folks without homes is a homelessness state of emergency. Right. Is that something that you would support? I think you have to put basically everything on the table when we're talking about that. You know, in some respects, uh, that sort of happened during the special sessions as, as um, lifting uh, land use and coding regulations as far as how we could um, place shelters. So I think, I think you, nothing can be off the table when we're trying to tackle this really, really fundamental problem that not enough people have a safe place to call home. So to me, everything's got to be considered. How we fund these projects, um, our land use laws, um, our city codes, um, and so to me it's like we have to have a, a varied and open discussion if we're really going to tackle this problem. Another solution that's been um, thrown out there is the, and the notion of a state real estate sales tax or property tax right. on homes worth more than a half million dollars to support affordable housing. Right. What's your take on that? Yeah, I know a number of different states have those types of revenue resources. You know, I think in the next session, we're going to have to take a hard look at the steps we've taken so far to, to do affordable housing projects. And I think Ben's been doing a pretty good job of putting together those different funding resources and starting to be known to different developers do these types of projects is a place that is welcome and uh, accommodating, is willing to work hard to create these types of projects. So we need to look throughout the state and figure out what's working, how are they getting these projects funded and get them off the ground replicate and expand on those going forward. So I think that's got to be the approach that we take. Multiple communities in our state are, are facing this, this issue. Who's having success? Let's replicate what they're doing and expand on those successes. I can only imagine it's only going to get more acute. And we, you know, we've been reporting a little bit on that this week. Just now we're seeing a new in migration um, into Bend. Right. Um, even, well, we had the wildfires. I mean, yeah, the too. wildfires, I mean, um, even just the, the fact that Folks in the city can work, can come and work and live here, and not have to pay high rents in their their city apartments and things like that. Right. Um, just a comment. I can only see it getting more challenging. It it, it has to be a fundamental problem that we we, we tackle go, going forward, and, and it's it's not one of those things where there's one magic solution to it. It's it's about being creative and responsive and flexible, and it's about being open to new ideas of of tackling tackling this issue, being at smaller homes, um, increasing density in part of our community. So we have to take a broad view and see like, how can we have the community that we wanna have, which is everybody in this town has a safe and stable place to call home. Let's shift gears again um, and talk about, uh, what's your opinion on the, the out-of-state corporate timber industry operating in Oregon and what would you do to make them more accountable to Oregon communities and the state as a whole? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Like I said, I grew up uh, I grew up in a logging town, right? My uncle was a logger. I actually paid for college by working at the Krupp Lumber Mill when I was a kid. My great uncle had a small family-owned lumber mill. Um, and that industry in Oregon has gone through some big, big changes. So here's, what hap here's my basic understanding of what's happened with private timber. We're still cutting trees on private timber lands. Okay? We used to have the uh, uh, ability to collect revenue off of that. Okay? It was... Um, different types of revenue measures. And the timber industry asked for modifications to try to preserve that industry and to preserve jobs in that. Well, what happened was we got rid of those revenue measures. And so if you hear about some small town that's closed their library or can't afford basic services for their community, in a large part because we got rid of those revenue measures, the jobs that we thought we were going to preserve don't exist anymore because of consolidation and automation. The same amount of jobs don't exist in the woods or in mills anymore. And then we were exporting lumber. And at least there was this hope that we were preserving um, you know, locally owned businesses. But more and more of our private timberland is owed by hedge funds in New York City. So 
we're not getting revenue. Uh, the, the, the money that's being made off of timber is going out of state. And to top that all off, we have much less environmental protections than our neighboring states do, Oregon, Wash or, I'm sorry, Washington, Idaho, and California. So we're not protecting our watersheds as much. So we're getting very little, re we're getting very little value out of, out of our, our private timber sales right now. I think we need to relook at some of those revenue measures that were in place um, back in the 70s through the 90s, in large part because a lot of those communities have been struggling for years and years and years. And if we're not generating revenue off one of their main resources, well, then we're going to continue to read about that small town that has a closed library or other, doesn't have other essential um, social services. So cannabis is another one we wanted to touch on, and we felt that um, the conversation at the legislative level right now kind of centers around um, just looking at ways to uh, foster interstate commerce. Right. What's your take on that, or do you have any um, policy points regarding yeah, so that? Yes, there's been some discussion about how can we have interstate commerce with the other neighboring states, and that's something I think we need to look at. I, you know, really it's gonna take federal legislation to create a cohesive set of policies throughout this country, and now we have this patchwork of some states it's legal, some states it's not legal. Uh, to me, it's about how do we get, you know, it's a legal industry. How do we get that industry prepared for the changes that are potentially going to be taking place on a, on a federal level? You know, we are, I think we're going to generate something like 150 plus million dollars in tax revenue um, going forward. To me, it's like, how do you start having some foresight to when I believe that the changes are going to happen on the federal level in other states? How do you get our businesses prepared to be able to, um, to compete with other, other states? And so to me, it's, I appreciate those laws and policies that we've been contemplating and working on so that we are prepared when, when I, the changes and the trends that we're seeing continue. Getting close to the end, um, we want to know um, what's, your, what's your take on strengthening the state's gun laws? Um, and if you support that, any specifics to do so? You say state gun laws? State's gun laws, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm really proud to be the Moms Demand Action Gun Sense uh, candidate distinction in this campaign because I take gun safety very, very seriously, right? I, I see too much of it in, in, in my work. So the measure that had, was not been able to been voted on for the last two or the full session and the short session was a gun safety measure, a safe storage measure, right? So requiring people to maintain their guns in a safe manner when they're at home, so the trigger lock or in a gun safe. It's sort of a no-brainer to me. You can go down to the sheriff's office and there's actually a barrel of trigger lock there. You can just take one for free. That's, I have a firearm in my home and that's what I use and that's where I got it. Uh, it also requires people to report the theft of guns when they're, when they're stolen. I really, I've, I've had numerous cases where young people have stolen guns out of uh, unlocked cars and haven't been reported for days. So we have to do more to strengthen our gun safety laws. I believe that bill is a sort of is a common sense way to, to create, create greater gun safety in our, in our community. Great. So um, I made the mistake of not asking the same question of your opponent, but I'm gonna follow up with her sure. um, off video because I wanted to touch a little bit on um, the ads that are going back and forth. <laughs> I'm not sure if I could say back and forth, but I don't think just the can. ads, the ads that are, um, that are targeting you. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond in any way that you'd like to about the ads that are naming you specifically? Right. Um, I think they are preposterous. I'm a father and a prosecutor. Of course I take sex trafficking seriously and we know that there are children being exploited in our community. I spent the last 15 years working on cases of domestic violence, working on cases involving abused and neglected children. I am a school volunteer for the last 18 years. I am on our parks board because I believe every child should have access to an active and healthy lifestyle. I am nearly 10 years on the board of Costa Central Oregon advocating on behalf of kids in foster care. I have dedicated my career to standing up and fighting to make sure that we have a safe place for our kids and our kids can feel safe. I get it. I understand the ads. And, and quite honestly, if I was representative health, I would not want to be talking about my voting record either, right? She voted against school funding. She voted against the expansion of internet during a global pandemic when more people are accessing their health care, their livelihood, and their education through the internet. She voted against climate change legislation. She voted against increases in, for affordable housing. 
you know, I, I'm running because I think we can do better. I know we can do better. We can make real investments in Oregon and Oregonians to help push the state forward. Um, I'm really, really disappointed to see those ads. Um, they're not accurate, and, and I think she, well, you can ask her why she's, why she's running those ads, and, and you should ask her about those votes on what I believe are fundamental pieces that we need for here in Oregon. So um, have, is there anything that we haven't talked about today that's important to you? I just, you know, I, I have a daughter who's in third grade, right? And, and to me, education is such a fundamental piece of what we need to be doing for our, our kids. You know, one out of five kids in Oregon doesn't graduate high school. You know, we are below average compared to the rest of the country and, and, how, and how our schools perform. We need to do a better job of making sure we have a school system and education system that works for all kids, right? We need to make sure that, that one out of five, that's so much unrealized potential. And that's, 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 that's just so much unrealized potential and talent. You know, I was hopeful that when Representative Helt went to Salem, she was gonna deliver on her promise to fight for our schools. And I was just, I'm so disappointed when she voted against the Student Success Act, the act that was is going to change three decades of underfunding in our schools. You know, what I like about the Student Success Act lowers class sizes, more nurses and, and more nurses and mental health counselors in our school. I mean, you touched on the, the mental health crisis in, in this country and targeted funding for our kids that are, are struggling, right? So grants to individual school districts so that we don't have one out of five kids. Um, dropping out of high school. You know, I look at school funding and climate change through the exact same lens, right? I look at it through the eyes of my eight-year-old daughter. What are we doing for our kids? How are we supporting them? And what kind of world are we living, le leaving for them? And if we're not creating quality schools that work for all kids and we're not combating, com um, combating climate change, we're not doing enough for our kids. I'm running so that I can go to Salem and make sure that we have a bright future for our kids and families here in Bend and Oregon. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you. And thanks for, well, I think we are finished for the day. Thank you for taking part in the democratic process and yeah. for sitting for this interview. Oh, pleasure, nice seeing you again. Yeah. All right.